So would you take your Bibles this morning and let's turn to Psalm 46. Psalm 46. I had planned previously to say to you this morning again, let's turn to Matthew. We will do that again at some point yet future, but for today, I think it is fitting that we meditate on this psalm, and I'm grateful for already the way our minds and hearts have been directed to our God in the reading of Scripture and the singing of truth this morning. You know, friends, life in these days is proving to be increasingly difficult. It seems that from every quarter and every front, weight on our souls is continually increasing. I guess I could say it this way, weight on our souls is continually increasing for those who are thinking. If we go through life rather oblivious, um, we may just let it roll off our backs, but if we're thinking about what is actually going on around us, and we're comparing that to what our God has said in His Word, there, there is a weight that takes its toll on the thinking person. And in recent days, I've noted a Uh, repeatedly as I've talked with people, that professing believers seem more and more troubled, more and more restless, more and more anxious and even fearful because of all that's going on around us. They observe what's happening in society. They are seeing what's going on with illness. I was actually on a call this week with a missionary pastor from Hong Kong, and it was interesting as he was describing the fear in that land as they are seeing a rise in COVID numbers again, and, and, and he was describing almost a fear that was gripping people and causing the, the people around him to freeze and not be able to do anything for fear of sickness right now. He said, by the way, he said, this is our fourth wave of rising numbers in Hong Kong. And he was describing the fear that is gripping the people around him. I mean, I think we have to face it as Christians in a world that is not loyal to our God, has no allegiance to their Creator. I think the Bible is clear that our striving to do good in this kind of a world, a sin-cursed world, will be a wearying task for the soul of the saints. If you and I aren't feeling a weariness in this, it's probably because we're not thinking and we're not wrestling deeply with things that our God has given us to wrestle with. Galatians warns this in Galatians 6, verses 7 through 9. You know these verses. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from, from, the, from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And then he warns, let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Now why would he sound a warning like this unless... The bent of our heart, the tendency of our fallenness is to grow weary. The warning is the fact that we do this. We do grow weary in the midst of all of this. And we are tempted to give up. I just wonder how many of us this morning know all too well the struggle of growing weary of doing good. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand this morning, but I do want you to let the question sink in. I want you to answer it in your heart. I want you to think deeply about it. If you were to be painfully honest about what is really going on deep down inside your own heart this morning, would you have to acknowledge the fact that you often live in recent days, your life, on the verge of giving up because you've begun to grow weary of doing good? And what's the point? You try and it's not appreciated. You do what you know to do and no one seems to care. You try to love people and they resist you. And people just don't even seem like they want to be around each other anymore. Why even do good? 
It's the way the mind runs. Hmm. If, if we're honest about the fact right now, this new supposed virtue of what we call now distancing, it's not helping any of us. It's not helping with close and committed and accountable contact with the brethren in the church. In fact, I, I've talked with people in our church who are nervous about asking someone else to even talk to them right now or have a meal with them. They're not sure if they can cross the aisle and actually have a conversation right now because distancing is a virtue and we, we, we dare not offend someone, right? It's not helping us spiritually. It may serve some practical purposes, and I'm not saying that there aren't things that we need to be cautious about in an age of illness. But friends, can we just face what it's doing to our souls? That where there once were really close relationships right now, we're questioning, is there even a relationship anymore? Is there? In fact, maybe you'd have to admit that of late you find yourself drifting farther and farther and farther from the close connections you once had right here in this church. Because honestly, your, your heart is so burdened and so wearied by your struggles with life and, and the uncertainty of this current time that you've begun to pull away and to, to occupy yourself with other things. And you just give yourself to other things than and that which God would have you give yourself to. Those whom God would have you give yourself to. This morning I want to direct our attention to a text of Scripture I think that reminds us where our help and our strength and our protection and our stability and our encouragement and our peace come from in times of difficulty, upheaval, and uncertainty. What are we trusting? You see, so often we talk in terms of what are we doing, and I want to ask the question again and again and again. What are you trusting? Who are you trusting? Because I don't think we ask that question. Right now, all people want to know is, are you a masker or a no-masker, right? Were you for Trump or were you for Biden? What did you do? How did you vote? What do you wear? Where do you go? How do you spend your time? I'm asking, who are you trusting? What is your heart and soul anchored in? Because we're not asking those questions. We're worried about everything else. But what's going on with our soul when it comes to our relationship with our God? And brethren, it is shaking us. And it is troubling us. And it is dividing us. And it must not. See, with all that we've just considered, when we consider the current climate and culture and season that we're in the midst of, I want to ask you to turn. I've asked you to turn to Psalm 46. I want to direct your attention here because there are comforting words and instructing words for us in a season just like this one. You know these words. Let me read them aloud. It's 11 verses I want to read. And then I want to spend some time this morning just meditating on these things. Psalm 46, beginning at verse 1, we read this. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters His voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, 
Behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Very quickly, just let me give you some basic information about the psalm. I think it will help us in our thinking this through. But this well-beloved psalm was originally written to be sung by a choir that would have led the people of God in worship and, and called them then, as, as they called them in worship, to trust and to praise the God who was their protector. It's one of the several psalms that were known as the consolation psalms because they offered encouragement and consolation to the people of God in the midst of times of deep trial and difficulty. It's one they would have returned to when they knew their souls desperately needed to be reminded of, of where they were to be anchored in difficult times. One does not have to study this text very long before it becomes clear that the psalm is intended to strengthen and stabilize the people of God in the midst of great turmoil and upheaval. That's why this text is here. In fact, this is the text of Scripture that inspired Martin Luther to write his well-beloved hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. In fact, Luther would often not refer to a mighty fortress. He would just say, let's sing the 46th. He's talking about the psalm. What did he write? You know these words. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing? Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing, just ask who that may be. Christ Jesus, it is He. Lord Sabaoth, His name. From age to age, the same. And He must win the battle. Clearly, Martin Luther understood what the Lord was saying to His people through this psalm. He understood something that the psalmist understood as well. What did he understand? That when we trust in our own strength, all of our striving results in losing. Can I say it to us this way, friends? We put too much, far too much confidence in our own striving. In our own planning in our own working, in our own doing. This is what this psalm reminds us not to do. In fact, Luther understood as well that when we trust in our Lord and take refuge in Him, He wins the battle. This is why I said it's not always a question of what are you doing, it's a question of who are you trusting. I'm all about God's people working hard and doing what is right and pursuing righteousness and, and going about good, mean, good means to, to good ends. But here's the problem. Many times we work and then we trust our work. We trust in what we do and how we think and how we plan. And friends, this is the problem. When we do that, we're not trusting God. We're trusting us. This is what I think the psalmist was teaching in our text. And friends, this is something we want to use the remainder of our time this morning to work through and to consider, to wrestle with these big ideas that are found in the text. So there's three big ideas I want you to see from the text this morning. 
Rather simple, they build on one another. The first one is this. I want you to see that God is our refuge and strength. It's a plain statement in the opening phrase of the psalm. We'll see this. But secondly, I want you to see this, that God is our refuge and strength when the natural order is upset. Finally, we'll see in the text this, that God is our refuge and strength when national peace is disrupted. This is what this psalm reminds us about this morning. So let's use the remainder of our time just to work through these key principles. First of all, then, let's consider the fact that God is our refuge and strength. He's our refuge and strength. As we saw in the opening verse of the psalm, the psalmist stated this very plainly in verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. The opening phrase of this verse, the psalmist makes two very plain statements. First, he says that God is our refuge. He's our refuge. The term refuge literally means a a shelter from danger. A a, a place in which we hide and are protected. It's the kind of safe place or strong tower that the writer of Proverbs referred to in Proverbs 18 and verse 10. When the writer of Proverbs said, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. We're safe there. I think that's one of the concerns for many in our day is we wonder, is anywhere safe? There's a lot of talk about safe spaces and all of us wonder, are there any such things any longer? Places that you're really safe. Many Christians, I think, wonder that and it's sad. How many Christians, it seems, are very fearful of life? Fearful of what will be said to them or about them. Fearful of what they may face. Fearful of the opposition that will come. Just a couple of weeks ago, I had a conversation with one of my daughters as we were driving along. And and, and this young one was just saying to me how they were concerned about the current state of the country and where things were going. And I thought, wow, I didn't know that they were aware of all the things that were going on in our country But I'm listening to this one who has many more years to live in this nation or on this earth, should the Lord tarry, than I have left, expressing to me great concern about the fact that as they are observing this country, this the rise of hatred for Christians. I'm hearing this young one in my home wrestling already with the question, how do I stay faithful to God in a land that hates people who try to be faithful to God? And her fears aren't ones she holds alone. Because I talk to other believers who express the same kind of fear about what's going to happen and how are we going to stand and how do we remain faithful when all of this goes south. The Lord is a strong tower that His people run into and are safe. Do you believe that? Or is that, is that kind of the th- kind of thing you, you write on a, on a card to somebody, but you don't really live it, <laughs> right? It's, it's like hallmark theology. Or is it real? Does it change the way you think and live and save and give and spend yourself in this life right now because you know that God is your refuge. When my brother bought his home here in North Carolina. We went and did a walkthrough with them, and they've got a, a spot that was built by the previous owner under their driveway. <laughs> they actually built under the driveway this little concrete room that was intended to be a tornado shelter. I mean, it's like six or eight feet underground, concrete and so forth, place you could climb in and, and be safe. And, and it's like, man, tornado comes, that's where you want to be. Underground, where the winds can't get to you, you know you are safe. Friends, do you know that your God is far more securing of you than any shelter in your basement? Do you live like that? 
believe like that? You see, the passage is teaching us, friends, that our God is the place of safety in whom we take refuge to hide from danger. And in Him we are safe. You say, well, lots of Christians go through very hard things and they suffer pains. That doesn't seem safe to me. It comes down to how you define your terms. Eric Seip was here and talking with us at the pastor's retreat, but followed us his time with us here. He said he was counseling someone not terribly long ago in his church and they were they were wrestling with things because they had all kinds of illnesses they were battling with and they always had something new to tell him about their their health and and their decline and and he was describing how he was counseling them and and he said okay okay so uh, you got something new that's that's aching you and, and 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 ailing you so so what's the worst that could happen and he said the person's response was well well I could die he said no that's not the worst that could happen the worst that could happen is that you would live. He said, read your Bible. For to me to live is Christ and to die is better. See, we don't think like that, do we? The one who hides in God is safe, not just in this life, but eternally safe, my friends. He secures your soul, come what may in this life. What kind of security do you want? See, my concern is this. We have these ultimate realities, these these ultimate truths, and we tend to settle for far lesser ones. I I just want to know I can pay my bills. I just want to know I'm not going to catch this virus. I just want to know that that I'm not going to lose my job. I just want to know we can keep meeting at the church building. I just want to know that... And what does our God say? Hide in me and be safe forever. And we're far concerned with lesser things. And what he promises us is eternal. Friends, he's our refuge. But not only that, the psalmist tells us as well that he is our strength. He's our strength. The term strength is very, uh, is very literally is talking about God's strength to work on behalf of the people, of his people in times of trouble. Just listen to the way that David described this truth in Psalm 18, a familiar text to some of us as well. Uh, he, he said this, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. Know the fact that David begins the psalm by calling the Lord his strength and it goes on to use a number of other descriptives to explain his meaning. He calls him his rock, that God provides stability and security and strength. He calls him his fortress because he is a high place of refuge and defense in which his people can flee for protection. He calls him his deliverer. He rescues his people from harm. He calls him his shield. He provides protection in the midst of a battle. He calls him his horn because he moves as an instrument of defense or a battering ram, as it were, almost like the horns on a a goat that would batter and push enemies out of the way. He calls God a stronghold because he moves, I'm sorry, he is a place of refuge into which one can run and hide and be far removed from the assaults of the enemy. I mean, over and over and over, the psalmist used terms to make it clear of the kind of ways that God uses his strength to protect his own. <clears throat> and all of this seems to be with the psalmist as in mind in our text when he says that God is his people's strength. More than this, though, the writer of the psalm goes on to explain the opening verses of our text <clears throat> that God is a very present help in trouble. You know, the idea contained in the words of this very present help is that God is at hand. He's, he's very near. He, he's very easy to be found. You see, this is one of the things that I, I th- th- seem to think in, see in our culture far more is that people are thinking of God as really far away 
and our problems very near. God seems so small to us. He seems so far and so distant. And, and what we're facing, I mean, it's right here. It's in our face. It's enormous. What did the psalmist say? God is not only our refuge and our strength, but he's very present. He's right here. He knows. He sees. He's working. He's protecting. But friends, our perspective gets off because our problems often get in the way of our view of God, don't they? All we seem to see is the stuff that's troubling us. And we'll lose sight of the God who is sovereign over all. According to the psalmist, he's saying that God is not aloof and far removed from us. He's he's actually very ready and accessible as a helper for his people. So don't miss this. What is the psalmist telling us? He's saying that no matter what happens, no matter what difficulties arise, no matter what trials come, no matter how circumstances change, no matter how hard life becomes, I can say in the last week for us, no matter what losses you suffer, those who trust in God, our very present help are ultimately and eternally safe. Can I ask this question? Have you navigated the last few weeks of an election cycle with this thought anchoring your soul? Have you navigated the last few months of a worldwide quote-unquote pandemic with this thought anchoring your soul? Are you navigating the trials you are facing? Are you suffering the losses that you're suffering? Are you going through the situations that you're going through? Are you battling the difficulties that you're having to work your way through in this life with this reality anchoring your soul? Because my friends, what happens is this. We don't tend to, and it shows. It shows on our faces. It shows in our posture. It shows in the words we say. It shows in the attitudes we take with each other. Like it, it shows that this isn't how we're thinking. This isn't what we're believing. This isn't what's guiding and governing the way we're thinking and living. It's just not. For all we say, it, 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 because of how we respond, something else is how we're thinking. Something else is what we're believing. This is why Jesus could say of his own, when persecution comes, you rejoice. Here's the thing I'm concerned by. I've not heard a lot of rejoicing from the church in America of late. I've got to ask, is there much rejoicing coming from, from us? Before we move on, I want to make it sure that we notice what the psalmist tells us results from this kind of confidence in God. Look at verse 2 of our text. That was just verse 1 we considered. Look at verse 2. Therefore, because He is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble, we will not fear. We will not fear. Wow. You know the reason. The Scriptures are clear. The text is plain. Because God is our refuge and strength and very present help in trouble, we will not fear. This is what drives this reality. Note the fact that this statement is made prior to the trial. He's not even gotten to talking about the trials. I mean, he's just, he's just introducing the psalm at this point. In other words, this is a statement of confidence and enduring faith and the power and the the promise of God before the trouble comes. These are things he was confident of prior to that actually stabilized him through the difficulties that came. You see, the psalmist knows that God in whom he trusts, and he calls the people to determine before the difficulties arise that they will not fear because they have already taken refuge in God. That is not merely one we hide in when winds blow. God is one we hide in all the time. 
See, this is the thing. Most of us think we're strong enough until the storms come, right? We've got enough money until the bills come rolling in. We've got enough wisdom until we finally meet a problem we can't figure our way through. So we live our lives protecting ourselves and our own strength and our own wisdom most of the time. And then a trial comes and, oh, now let's run into God. As if He's our last resort. Not the resource in whom we live our lives. And here's the psalmist saying, when trials come, you won't fear because you're already in the refuge. You're already within the walls of the one protecting you. In fact, their confidence and our confidence should be so great that we determine to take refuge and rest in our God. Listen, come what may. Let the battles rage. Let the elections be lost. Let the diseases spread. I, I won't be shaken. You shouldn't be shaken. Because your God rules and reigns over all, and He is your protector. Not a candidate, not a doctor, not a governor. God. It doesn't mean you don't engage in the process. It means you trust one who is above it all. Do you? Would anyone around you believe that you do? Because of how you've been talking and living. And interacting. You see, this is something we say we know and believe and agree with, and then life happens, right? And suddenly what comes out isn't confidence, it's fear. What shows up isn't settled conviction, it's anger. And friends, that's not the way God's people are to respond when life shakes because they know already that God is our refuge and strength. And we hide in Him. You know, in the remainder of our text, the psalmist actually makes a number of what we might call exaggerated statements that address two big categories of trials that are often uh, among the biggest sources of unrest in the hearts of His people. These two categories make up the last two points, and we won't take as long on either of these as we did on the first. But I want you to note that we said, first of all, God is our refuge and strength. But notice when the psalmist then applies that principle. Secondly, God is our refuge and strength when, natural, when the natural order is upset. We might say when, when, when the earth beneath our feet starts to shake and when, when life as we know it gets turned upside down. When, when life is not as it has been. Just listen to the way that the psalmist describes the extremes of the, the natural disasters in our text. Look at verses 1 through 3 once again. God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. I mean, each thought in this, in verses 2 and 3, describes a change from the natural order of things, the way things normally are, the, things, the way things we know things ought to be, to, to the way things now are in the time of trouble. The earth is usually solid and firm, but now it gives way, it crumbles beneath our feet. The mountains are usually stable and immovable, but now they are moved from where they were planted to the middle of the ocean. The ocean tides usually rise and fall with regular measurable consistency, but now the oceans roar and foam. We might call this in the midst of a storm, a, 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 a storm surge. Robert, you're familiar with that down at the shore, right? The storm surge. It, and suddenly what we've known as normal isn't normal anymore, and, and it starts to make people nervous. Because a storm surge isn't usually a good thing. 
Mountains are usually solid and unshakable, but now they tremble at the swelling of the ocean. I mean, this description is of, of, of natural disaster, and clearly the psalmist is painting the picture of, of what we might call worst case scenario in natural disasters. Entire mountains are now in the ocean. It's as if he's saying that even if the worst case scenario of natural disaster was to take place, we will not fear. Now, I just want you to think about North Carolina when the weatherman says flurries are coming. Not, 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 not accumulated snowfall, flurries. There's no milk or bread. I, I mean, I'm telling you, we empty stores with the thought that there might be flakes in the air, right? There's going to be some, some, some wind gusts of 40 or 45 miles an hour. Call off school! Call off school! I mean, the wind's going to blow a little today. We've been trained, Christian. We've been trained to be afraid. Winds blow, snow falls, the earth quakes, fires rage, locusts swarm, diseases spread. And what have we been taught to do by our world? Be terribly afraid. Fear everything around you. Don't go out. Don't talk to anyone. Don't, don't possibly put yourself in any kind of risk. Why? Because the worst thing that can happen is that you and I suffer some kind of an illness and die. We get in some kind of an accident and die. We have some kind of a problem and now we die. Question, Christian, what happens to you and me when we die? We're, we're with the Lord. And yet we find ourselves living in fear of what we imagine is a worst case scenario, which would merely be a friend that would take us safely home. But we don't think like that. We don't live like that. We don't talk like that. We live gripped by fears and anxieties and worries. And friends, not a word I've said, have, have you heard me say, to, says live foolishly. What I said was live fearlessly. There's a difference. And many of us think they're one and the same. And they are not. The psalmist said, the earth could crumble beneath my feet, the waves could knock the mountains into the ocean, and I will not fear. Because my God is the one who protects me. I'm invincible until he's ready for me to come home. Do, do we live like this? Or do we not? Friends, in other words, we find this language of natural disaster and, and, and we, we look at this and we say, no, this is not how I'm going to live. Habakkuk, at the end of the book of Habakkuk, said something very similar. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fall, fail, and the, yield, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet, yet, okay, everything's gone. The, the food I counted on, the, 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 the crops that I planted, the, the, the animals that I've, I've raised to be food for my family, they're all gone. Uh, the fields have burned, uh, the, the, the crops have died, the animals have been slaughtered. There's nothing left for me to eat. How do you respond? The grocery stores are empty. There's no gas at the gas stations. 
Your cell service has been cut off. Your internet is not working. And the power is out at your house. What's coming out of your mouth in that season? What does Habakkuk say? Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. Do you rejoice? Or do you gripe? We've got to think like God calls his people to think. Friends, our text contrasts our thinking here. He says the, the roaring and the foaming of the oceans in times of disaster. The, 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 the psalmist goes on to describe here the, the gracious provision of a, of a river. So you have the roaring and foaming of the oceans and now a, a river, he says, that makes glad the city of God. Look at verses 4 and 5 in our text. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The oceans are roaring and foaming. The mountains are crumbling. The, the ground is disintegrating beneath His people's feet. But what's happening in the city of God? The river flows. The people are protected. They're at peace. God is helping her. Look at the contrast of the language. We know questioning the fact that the, the security of the saints is actually rooted in the sovereignty of God. This is what he's saying. Our security is not found in our plans and our works, but in God, who is sovereign over all. You see, in the face of natural disaster and disorder, dwelling in the city that belongs to God, which is the habitation of the Most High God, is what strengthens and gladdens the hearts of God's people. In other words, we could say it this way. Our strength does not come from knowing nothing bad will happen to us. Rather, friends, our strength comes from knowing that God is with us, come what may. He's sovereign over everything, including the trials and the troubles and the losses and the difficulties. So much more that could be said here, but we need to move on. One final point. We said God is our refuge and strength, and He's our refuge and strength, and the natural order is upset. But finally, consider this. God is our refuge and strength when national peace is disrupted. I found this especially applicable to our day. You know, all of us can certainly identify with the thoughts I think contained in this final section of the text. Look again at verses 6 and following where we read this. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters His voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how He has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still. I know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Just note the fact that the nations are raging and the, the kingdoms are tottering. The, the psalmist is pointing to the, dis, the, the disruption, as it were, of the normal political order of the day. Some have said that this may well refer to the attacks that, they would, that would come from Israel's enemies from outside. Maybe the disruptions even from within the nation as we think of uh, King David and the way his sons were, were kind of coming against him. You think about the disruptions to what they knew as the normal source of peace. Ever there was a day when these words were especially appropriate, I think today is the day for us and our age. I think many of us cannot recall a time within our lifetimes when there has been quite so much political and civil unrest, or at least the threat of such, as there is in our country right now. And the rest of this text is clear that God opens His mouth and He melts the earth. 
while protecting his people by being their fortress and their defense. See, this is the thing. I think we put far too much weight in our thinking on the ability of politicians and national leaders to to make things peaceful or not so. We hang our hopes on the the next candidate. We, 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 We are confident that they will get the job done. And what does it say here? The nations are tottering. God opens his mouth and the earth melts. Like they're just trying to convince their party to go with them on policies in our country. Our God speaks and the elements melt. Which one do his people need to trust in? Don't miss the fact that the psalmist declares that any true and lasting peace, I mean, this is the language here, any true and lasting peace among the nations only comes because God makes wars to cease. What are you trusting, friend? Where does peace come from? Does it come from us having a majority? Does it come from some kind of political takeover? Does it come from from the fact that, hey, we're packing and nobody better mess with us? Where does peace come from? So you and I tend to think it comes from from the sources that that, that we have at our disposal. It it comes from political power. It comes from our preparation. It comes from our wisdom and our planning. What does he say? Peace comes because God makes wars to cease. Friends, far too often our internal peace and security or our lack thereof is based upon the peace and stability that is taking place around us. Things are peaceful out there. Okay, I'm peaceful in here. Things aren't peaceful out there. I'm not at peace in here. Think of the old statement, right? Uh, If mama ain't happy, Ain't nobody happy. What's the idea? Keep everybody around you happy so that you can be as well. And if they're not happy, then we, we can't be, right? Wait a second. Too often, our internal peace and security or lack thereof is found in the lack of or the existence of peace around us. But God reminds us here in our text that, friends, true peace and security is not rooted in our nation's peace and security. It's not. That's not where our peace comes from. In fact, we have to understand the reality that our peace, friends, and our security is rooted in the presence and the protection of our God. Come what may around us. Hmm. It's exactly what the psalm declared in verse 7 when we saw that the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Twice we're told this. As we close, let me just direct your attention once more to the final verses of the text because because this is somewhere that Pastor Dave pointed us a few moments ago. Verse 10, what do we read? Be still and know that I am God. I want you to think about this for a moment. In times of natural disaster, political upheaval, and even soul-deep unrest... The tendency for us is to be panicked and frantic. We tend to run our mouths a lot, right? I tell everybody what I'm dealing with. I tell everybody what I'm suffering. Tell everybody what's on my mind, right? That's all I can talk about. What's going on inside of me? We tend to be anxiously racing from one thing to another to distract ourselves, maybe from one person to another. There's always got to be something going on in life to make sure that I can try to keep some semblance of peace, and so I I just distract myself. That's going to be my solution. We tend to fill our minds with the noise of news media and current events. Let's Let's just keep the information coming. Maybe I'll find some peace there. Maybe I'll figure out a solution to my problems. We tend to choose noise over silence. Because we're afraid of silence. Because you know what happens when, when things get quiet? We don't like what comes to our mind. We don't like what we see. We don't like what we hear. We tend to desperately devise solutions of our own making. We will figure out a solution. We tend to talk much 
and pray little. Life gets rough, and we go crazy. But God's words are clear when it counsels, be still. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Friends, this is the counsel that we each need to hear in times of trouble and distress. We don't need to a new social media platform to solve our problems. We don't need to find a new source of news network, right? New, new, new net news network, that'll solve it. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get truth there and that'll fix everything. Well, I've watched some reactions among conservative evangelicals over the last few weeks that just, they just strike me as just foolish. Our confidence is going to be in where we get our news. We've been down that road before. How's that working for you, friends? What's your solution? What's the solution to the problem? Where, where is the source of peace for God's people? I would say that this is the counsel we must preach to ourselves whenever our lives seem to be falling apart. Be still. Just, just be quiet. Stop talking. Stop running around like a chicken with your head cut off. Stop, stop looking for another person to say something into your ear. Stop, stop, just stop. Listen to your God. Be still and know that I am am God, he says. But we tend to go everywhere but there, don't we? It's vital for us to note the fact, friends, that the glory of God is at stake in all of this. In verse 10, he says twice, I will be exalted. See, you and I think at the end of the day, this is all about our comfort. <laughs> it's all about us keeping our money. It's all about us keeping our peace. It's all about us being happy. And at the end of the day, it's not about any of those things. It's about the glory of God. The reason we're so frantic is because we think it's about us. <laughs> and it's not. It's about God. God. So by God's grace, I would pray for us that He would grant to us the grace to think and to speak and to live in the midst of our trials and our difficulties in such a way that first we are stabilized, is what He tells us. He's stabilizing His people and that He is glorified, most importantly. Because friends, in the season that we are in, we can run a thousand different places but they will not be the anchors for our souls. There's one solution. There's one source of peace and security and safety and refuge for God's people. And it is not in politics and it is not in, in medicine and it is not in education and it's not in news media. It is in God and God alone. Until that's settled in our mind, friend, we can chase our peace in every other place and we will not find it. Because it is not to be found in those places. It's to be found in God alone. So by His grace, may this be true for us. My soul needs this. Maybe yours does too. Let's pray to that end. Father, Thank you. 
Thank you this morning for your word. So many things, so many moving parts, so many difficulties right now in our lives and so much tendency in us to make this a whole lot more complicated than it ought to be. We think that more noise will solve the solution. We think that that more energy and more effort will be the source of our peace. And you have told us you alone are. You are our refuge. So what should we do when life is roaring around us? We should be still and know that you are God. So, Father, I would ask for grace this morning for me and for my family and for our church that we would be a people who are confident in you. Father, that our confidence in you would motivate holy living and righteous talk and living and speaking and ministering in such a way as to bring you glory. But, Father, to realize that the source of our peace and security and stability is not in us It's in you. So we ask that you would stabilize your people this morning and that you would, more importantly, glorify yourself. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you for what you do in us because of the truth, for it's in Christ's name that we pray these things. Amen.